Okay, so my project was music theory of therapy approaches and their benefit in the treatment of Alzheimer's patients. And the objective of my research was to investigate music therapy as a possible alternative for Alzheimer's treatment, and additionally, uh, analyze the effectiveness of um, music therapy and not only um, what is traditionally thought of like the main deficiency in Alzheimer's patients, um, autobiographical memory, but also the positive effect it has on the emotional health of um, emotional and holistic health of both the Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers as well. And so obviously the disease I'm talking about is Alzheimer's disease. And um, from this diagram, you can see the comparison of a normal brain versus an Alzheimer's, uh, a brain with Alzheimer's disease. And um, simply put, the neurons, um, they have plaque buildup and they get tangles in their neurofibers. And this results in the brain not working how it's supposed to. And um, this can eventually lead to communication problems from one part of the brain to the other and overall shrinkage of the brain. And um, thankfully, uh, Sadie gave a good background on dementia already, but that is, um, as she mentioned, Alzheimer's disease is the main cause of dementia. So it actually causes around 70% of dementia cases. And um, a common misconception is that like either they're synonymous or like one is like the same thing as the other, but actually um, Alzheimer's disease is um, what causes dementia, and dementia is the disorder that causes the symptoms. And um, as of now, uh, like Sadie mentioned, there's no known cure for Alzheimer's. So um, what happens is that you treat the, sim the symptoms that are caused by dementia. And so the treatment can either be with pharmacological options, which are like medicine or drugs, or non-pharmacological options, which include therapy. Um, and music therapy is the non-pharmacological option that I'm going to be talking about today. And so um, the reason music therapy has actually been very popularized as a treatment option for Alzheimer's in the past decade um, is because of actually new discov they discovered that um, the musical memory region of the brain, um, which can you, you can see outlined here, um, this is actually a, um, a real brain scan of a brain with Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that the musical memory region is um, so the warmer and more intense colors are where the Alzheimer's disease is more is progressed more, and so the musical memory region is actually um, preserved until the very last stages of the disease, right before the disease attacks the brainstem, which is when um, usually patients will pass away. So it is preserved until the very last stages, and event, um, additionally, uh, music can serve not only as a treatment option for Alzheimer's but also as a preventative measure. So. Um, it's actually, studies have shown that playing music um, throughout your life into your older years um, have significantly decreased the uh, risk of contracting Alzheimer's itself. And additionally, uh, the sense of self is heavily correlated with music. Um, I think as we all know, most people have uh, songs or music that they correlate with, you know, happy memories, sad memories, uh, core moments in their lives. And actually, researchers have shown that a, um, a lack of sense of self or a lack of self-consciousness is actually one of the core deficiencies in Alzheimer's patients, which is why you see in the later stages of the disease um, uh, the, the symptoms such as like forgetting who you are or forgetting very close family members or even like a daughter. Um, and that's why preserving the sense of self for as long as possible is very important in treating Alzheimer's patients. And so uh, the two main music therapy approaches that um, I researched in my project were active and passive music therapy. And these music therapies can be split into either individualized or non-individualized. So individualized is basically just, it's personalized for a, a specific patient. And then non-individualized would be like, for example, like a live performance where it's the same for everybody and it's not just specified for one person. And additionally, I like to mention the difficulties of creating studies with um, anything with Alzheimer's disease in general because it is a very wide spectrum. So um, everybody has different symptoms and at different, obviously, at different stages of the disease, um, you have more severe symptoms or less severe symptoms and people react very differently um, to certain treatments. So one treatment way, may work very well for one person and not as well for another person. So it's hard to get a very definitive, strong uh, piece of evidence for the efficacy of a single treatment in studies. And so active music therapy, as the name suggests, um, is actively producing music. So uh, this can include things such as like practicing instruments or singing. Um, and in this figure, you can actually see, um, her name is Mary Wilkinson. She founded an organization um, that goes around and plays for Alzheimer's um, uh, nursing homes or day centers around the US. And she just encourages him the members of the facilities to either sing along or practice instruments or you know anything they can do to actively participate and be involved in the making of the music.
And another example of active music therapy would be uh, rhythmical training. And this uh, can include not only just playing non-melodic instruments such as the bongos, but also like clapping or dancing or moving to background music. So it is very, um, very inclusive. So everybody can be involved in active music therapy, even if you can't, you don't have natural singing or uh, uh, playing instrument abilities. And um, the benefit of active music therapy compared to passive music therapy is the dynamic element. And so this makes it um, that not only you have to be interactive and involved with the therapy, but you also have the dynamic um, element, which is good not only for Alzheimer's patients, but um, people in general. It's just it's um, very important to stay moving and stay active and also preserve motor skills for as long as possible, especially in later stages of the disease where, you, where you'll see a deterioration um, of the motor skills and like at the stage where you have to get a caregiver um, or go nonverbal. Um, and so passive music therapy is the other type of uh, music therapy that I investigated. And this is not actively producing music, but it's music listening. So um, basically, uh, just listening to music is what constitutes passive music therapy. But it can be um, differentiated by either being personalized, individualized, or um, non-individualized. And so the important thing with um, individualized music therapy is that you can cater to towards someone's personal preference. So um, if the musical therapist found out what type of music that a certain person likes, they can figure out how to get um, a positive response from that person. And um, obviously everyone has like a song that they associate with happy memories. And so because the musical memory part of the brain is preserved until very late stages, this can actually stimulate other parts of the brain to like reactivate the, end, um, the memories even when like the traditional memory is deteriorating. And passive music therapy ha also has very good synergy with active music therapy. They don't have to be separated completely. Um, for example, if you're dancing, singing, or doing rhythm exercises, most likely you're going to be uh, listening to music in the background or playing with music. And additionally, you can pair uh, cognitive exercises with passive music therapy. So it doesn't have to be strictly music therapy. You can include like other games, such as um, even something as simple as like guessing a song after it's played. That can help stimulate other parts of the brain. Um, and it's something very easy to include after listening to music. And uh, additionally, uh, the individualized versus non-individualized aspect has actually been researched pretty thoroughly with passive music therapy specifically. Um, there was a study done where um, they had a group that was individualized and non-individualized um, participating in passive music therapy. And they actually showed that the individualized group um, experienced a much greater difference in self-consciousness, which is that sense of self aspect um, that's associated with like moral judgment and uh, personal identity. So those patients that like listen to a familiar playlist um, really held on to those pers that personal aspect of the music. And some other approaches that aren't strictly active music therapy or passive music therapy or like the mixed interventions that I mentioned, which are just like combining active music therapy and passive music therapy or uh, passive mu music therapy with like other types of cognitive exercises. Um, and additionally, caregiver or familial intervention isn't technically considered music therapy because the official definition of music therapy is that um, a certified licensed professional um, integrates therapy with music. But it can be just as effective or even more effective um, to do these same activities but with a family member and or uh, a caregiver and a person with Alzheimer's, especially because of the positive effect it has on the caregivers themselves. Um, as anyone who has had someone close to them with Alzheimer's, um, it can be very difficult to care for them and interact with them, especially towards the later stages, because um, in the very severe stages of Alzheimer's, you get things um, like behavioral changes, mood changes, and the people generally, um, a lot of the times, don't seem like the person they used to be. But music can serve as a bridge to connect these people, nevertheless. And uh, music is something that is very easy to bond over um, for the caregiver and the person with Alzheimer's as well. And I also researched approaches as Alzheimer's disease progresses because it is such a, it's a, a generally like a long disease. You have it for a long amount of time and symptoms get more severe as Alzheimer's goes on. Alzheimer's disease keeps going. Um, so mild Alzheimer's disease um, is the first stage of the disease. And at this stage, sometimes you won't even uh, experience symptoms or you're, you'll go undiagnosed. Um, and so basically people at this stage can participate in many of the same activities that they were able to participate um, when they were healthy or undiagnosed. And so uh, recreational music participation, active music therapy, anything that makes them feel 
like normal and like a healthy person is very helpful because um, for example, in this figure here, this is an individual, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and directly after his, um, his diagnosis, he became very agitated and depressed because it can be a very difficult diagnosis to deal with for a person because um, for a lot of people, they just take it as like a death sentence because there is no cure for the disease. But um, actually, after he started his musical therapy regimen, um, his wife described him that one hour that he practiced the trumpet, which he dropped for around 30 years before he started this regimen. He descri she described that one hour of the week as the best hour of the week because he seemed more like the most like his younger self. So he felt the most like when he was undiagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and additionally, you can pair this with, uh, again, uh, cognitive exercises, which can preserve overall brain health, and it's just good for a person in general. And so moderate Alzheimer's disease is when you begin to see the more pronounced dementia symptoms. And at this stage is usually when um, you'll want to get like a caregiver or be placed in a day center because it can be dangerous and it can be unrealistic to um, live uh, independently at this stage because of the symptoms such as like forgetting familiar places or um, not knowing where you are and so it can be very helpful to be placed in a day center because um, it gives them that social aspect to still be able to um, to socialize with other people but is also a very safe environment because there's professionals around and um, at these day centers it can actually be very easy and very cost effective to have you know live music and garner active participation like Mary Wilkinson um, and this is a, a really good way to get everybody participated in music therapy, and it can have very uh, positive effects. Um, and additionally, uh, this might be a good time to start an individualized plan with a therapist, um, because towards the later stages, uh, communication may get difficult with a patient with Alzheimer's. Eventually, sometimes uh, a lot of people go nonverbal, or they become aggressive and apathetic. And so, if you are, if the musical therapist is able to. Um, you know, get the preferences of the patient at this stage, they can continue on that therapy into the later stages, even without that communication with the patient. And so, uh, yeah, severe Alzheimer's is the very last stage of the disease. And um, at this stage, you'll begin to see um, the decline of motor skills. So um, you also need like around the clock care. And um, oftentimes you'll see the person um, undergo very severe mood changes, um, become not the person that they used to be. But, um, Music, uh, music can still uh, activate other parts of the brain that have been damaged by Alzheimer's disease. And although active music therapy might be difficult because of that lack of motor skills, um, passive music therapy, especially if it has been continued since the earlier stages of the disease, can still be easy to implement. And it can be used by caregivers, uh, family, and music therapists alike to just um, bring comfort to the person with Alzheimer's disease and reduce stress for both, both the caregiver and the person with Alzheimer's. And finally, the last part of my project was like the local application. Um, initially, the, the reason I actually uh, decided to research this topic was because uh, I played at our local Alzheimer, I played piano at the local Alzheimer's and Parkinson's Association. And um, honestly, it was something very easy. Uh, I can t I'm doing it every week. I've been doing it every week since then. And I did not expect at all the overwhelmingly positive uh, effects that it had on people, honestly. It was just, it's so easy to um, just go in there and I already enjoy playing music, so it's something that I enjoy. Um, and just the overwhelmingly positive response that I got from the people at that center, um, you know, asking me to play their favorite music or telling me that it just really brightens up their day. It's something that, honestly, I know a lot of students in here uh, are involved in playing music and I would heavily recommend in participating in something like this because it is just so rewarding and it's something that's so easy to do, but you just don't realize how much of a positive effect it has on other people. And additionally, um, as I said before, it is a preventative measure. Um, playing music into your older ages can really help prevent um, Alzheimer's disease, especially as we have an aging population. So um, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease is becoming more prevalent in society. So, um, so yeah, I just want to encourage everyone um, to pursue this as an approach, not only if you have a um, a family member or someone close to you with Alzheimer's. It's a way to reduce the reliance also on pharmacological options. Um, so as much as you can reduce like antipsychotic drugs that have very, uh, can have negative side effects, but music therapy is an option that has really, um, it's very minimally, it's non-invasive and it doesn't have a lot of negative side effects. So very promising treatment. Thank you. Is our local Alzheimer's and Parkinson's Association? 
Um, it's right, uh, if you go 17th Street uh, Bridge and then you t take a right, it's like right past Miracle Mile. So like right past like Publix and Fresh Market, like just uh, next to the like, Child Care Resource Center. I don't know if you know where that is, but um, it's right by there. Have you gone into like any nursing homes around here to do the same thing? I did actually, um, with the school, we did, um, uh, I don't know if it was a nursing home, but it, w it was something like that. Um, but it is very similar. Actually, my uh, piano teacher, she goes into um, nursing homes and hospices as well and like plays for uh, patients in hospice, and she says that's very rewarding. Did you, um, I mean, I know this is specifically focused on Alzheimer's, but did you happen to look or see if they're if doing music therapy and helping to recover from other diseases or anything? It, has it been researched and used in that also yes. in diseases that aren't just, you know, kind of like you said? It yeah, definitely. Happens. I actually, um, in my paper, I used, a stu I, I read a lot of studies that had to do with, like, it wasn't strictly Alzheimer's, so a lot of them had, like, dementia as like their focus because the symptoms come from dementia or um, actually it had uh, music therapy in specific rhythmical training um, with people with strokes mm -hmm. and also people with like concussions or like any sort of neurological um, disorder and it like all of them showed like positive improvements in those aspects as well. It also is used with non-communicative uh, yes. special needs kids. Yes, yeah. Actually, uh, a story uh, or um, something that I saw through an interview was um, this Alzheimer's patient that this Alzheimer patient that was uh, he was actually nonverbal, like completely nonverbal. And but uh, when they played like Sean Kingston, which was like his favorite artist, he actually like was able to completely speak like coherently and talk about like his love for music. And like that was the only time he would talk. Like he would not talk otherwise. So. like horseshoe part of your brain yeah horseshoe no i meant to say seahorse uh, <laughs> part of your brain that because when we were first born we're like one of the first things that happens is we're sunk to yeah and then exactly. for that to be the last part i feel like that's a really beautiful yeah cycle. and actually um this this part is something that i i mean my focus really wasn't on the neurological like mechanism part but i did read uh read one research paper specifically um or actually a lot of them were saying like, in like the conclusion notes, they were saying like, they would like to see more studies done on, um, on like the musical memory region of the brain because we really don't have like an idea of like the mechanism of Alzheimer's or like how it works. We kind of just know the general like, like what it is. Um, but um, especially with like the recent advancements in neurology, like with brain scans, like that was not something that was around like even like 10 years ago. So um, there's a lot of room to create studies and investigate that. Which music is, is better at helping with the... So something that I found is there's really no specific music. Like what, what um, a lot of studies found was that like the people that music, people, the music that people listen to or they preferred listen to, that was like what was most helpful. So like the individualized studies, what happened was like the musical therapist would like interview each of the Alzheimer's patients like individually and get their preferences and create a playlist based on their preference. And that was actually what helps the most uh, rather than like a playlist of just like popular songs from like an era or something. I, I, I have a hypothesis based on this picture here. Uh, so these black amyloids that you can break them off by sonication. You, I remember hearing about this too. Like basically shake, shake it off and you know, helps. Uh, but what about rock music? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, so any all the studies that I I don't think anyone mentioned that, so maybe that might be an <laughs> area that you might want to go into, but um, uh, possibly. <laughs> I think definitely, um, like, how music therapy can help, like, in other, because like, I really focused on Alzheimer's disease and didn't really see anything else, but, like, um, like I only saw one or two research papers on, like, music therapy and other um, disorder, like, neurological disorders specifically, but also um, things just like behavioral problems even, or um, especially nowadays because uh, of the heavy reliance on, like, uh, drugs and, like, antipsychotic drugs or even drugs in, like, adolescence, like, um, 
to, to for ADHD or any of these mental disorders that are becoming so prevalent nowadays. I feel like um, music therapy is a very, very like low cost, um, low risk way to, um, I mean, obviously it won't work for everyone, but it is a very viable option. And I think it would be important to research that future. Sadly, I think I recently read around 88 or 90 colleges are, are ending um, their music therapy programs, you know, just due to alignment, cost, and just, if you, you know, this therapy could be part of other schools or part of other programs. What do you think would be a good strategy to keep this important training? Well, I think, I mean, first of all, like, obviously awareness of the benefits of including um, music therapy in, like, a plethora of different disorders. But also, I think uh, what people fail to recognize a lot of the times is, like, the cost effectiveness of uh, musical therapy is just, like, unmatched, especially compared to, like, pharmacological options. I mean, obviously, it's amazing nowadays that we get to, like, research drugs um, in depth, especially with, like, AI and, like, the AI... Um, the discoveries with AI and drugs. So, I mean, I feel like that's getting a lot of the funding and focus nowadays. So um, people are like, like subconsciously moving towards that. But I think it's important to like recognize the efficacy of something that, I mean, has been around, like music has been around forever, but I mean, it is still a very much effective way. And it's still very important to like, um, include that and not just completely move towards these like novel approaches. How prevalent is it? Like, if we visited a hundred facilities that specialize in Alzheimer's treatment, how many? Like, would all one hundred be doing some form of this? I, okay. Ten or fifty or? Uh, definitely not like a hundred percent, but it's also it's not like uncommon, especially in um like like the discovery of the musical memory region. Like that's very popularized. Like a lot of the sites or all of, some of from some of the sources that I had were like like CDC like the. Um, uh, like National Health Organization, they had like a site on uh, musical therapy and Alzheimer's. So it is very popularized, especially um, with like, like the discovery of this musical memory region, like in the brain scans of the past decade. So I would say um, at least 75%, if not more. I mean, obviously they're not gonna be as developed or as prevalent in some places, but it is like, it's not like an unknown treatment. Like right. it is still pretty popularized. You're right about the cost, you can't be. Yeah, you really can't. And it's something that you can do like even even if you don't have like a formal um, like formal therapy, especially like Sadie mentioned, it can be difficult to get treatment in like third world or um, less developed countries. Like this could be a very effective treatment option. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.